Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome. My name is Maura O'Shea. I'm the Director of Education at the DeBritt Museum of American Art. Um, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon for another gallery talk related to our 2020 20 plus women at the MBMAA a year long exhibition uh, featuring exhibitions featuring women artists. Um, before we get started, I just want to invite all of you to put your questions in the chat and at the end we'll take questions. Uh, as many as we possibly can. I also want to welcome our many members and our new friends uh, from the Hancock Shaker Village who are joining us this afternoon. We're just thrilled to have you. We're also grateful to our presenting sponsor for the 2020 initiative, uh, Stanley Black and Decker for their exhibition support and programmatic partnerships throughout this year. And thanks also to Bank of America and Travelers and the Benzor Group for additional support in making these exhibitions and programs possible. Today, we're joined by Sarah Margolis Pinillo, who is going to be discussing uh, a wonderful topic that's related to the exhibition currently on view called Anything But Simple, Shaker Gift Drawings and the Women Who Made Them. It's on view through uh, mid-January, if you're able to visit the museum, I hope you can. Uh, Sarah's topic, her title of today's talk is Spirits and Superfluidities, Shaker Design in the Era of Manifestations. Sarah is a curator specializing in modern and contemporary craft and design. She is currently a curator of Hancock Shaker Village in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, where she oversees the collection, exhibitions, and artist residency program. Previously, Sarah held positions in the curatorial departments of American Folk Art Museum in New York City, Fry Art Museum in Seattle, Museum of Contemporary Craft in Portland, Oregon, and Cranbrook Art Museum in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. In 2017, Sarah also co-founded Lone Pine Farm and Studio, an artist residency and agricultural incubator. That sounds so fabulous. So welcome, Sarah. We're so pleased to have you. Thank you so much to Moore and to Lisa for this invitation. And thank you for to all of you out there who are joining us virtually. I'm very excited to speak to this uh, topic this afternoon. But first, my one disclaimer is that, yes, I'm a curator of contemporary design and craft. Uh, I'm not by any means a specialist on the gift drawings. So I am presenting the gift drawings sort of in relation to uh, my field of research, which is, of course, shaker design. So I will queue up my slides here. Um, two, I'm going to be going through things very quickly this, af this afternoon. So if you do have questions um, or would like to contact me following or would like the slideshow for your reference, um, please, my email's at the very end. Please feel welcome to reach out directly. Okay, so to begin, I'm going to just get a little bit didactic for those of you who are very familiar with the Shakers, but um, bear with me here. So first, who are the Shakers? The United Society of Believers in Christ's Second Appearing, or more commonly known as the Shakers, traced their roots back to England in 1747. Anne Lee, an illiterate woman working in a Manchester factory, stepped out of obscurity to become the spiritual leader, Mother Anne. She was a passionate visionary with charisma who mobilized a small group of eight followers to immigrate to the States in pursuit of religious freedom. In the century following their arrival in New York in 1774, the Shakers expand, expanded to over 20 communities that reached from Maine to Florida and as far west as Indiana. In the mid 19th century, there are approximately 5,000 Shakers. And today there are still three Shakers living what they call the Christ life at the Shaker community in Sabbath Day Lake, Maine, just outside Portland. Their Sunday worship services are open to the public, uh, not in COVID times, but should be again shortly. And I highly encourage any, all of you to go if, if at all possible. Though best known for what they made, particularly furniture and their stripped down minimalist design aesthetic, at their core, the Shakers are a spiritual utopian community rooted in European Protestant, Quaker and spiritualist traditions. 
The Shakers believe in dual Godhead. God is both mother and father to humankind, one being that encompasses both the masculine and the feminine. Jesus Christ was brought to earth as the son of God, and likewise, Anne Lee is believed to have been the female counterpart, God's daughter and mother to the Shakers. The three central tenets of the Shaker faith are commonly referred to the three C's, celibacy, confession of sin, and communal living. In Mother Anne's view, celibacy was the only way to free oneself from earthly carnal desires and allow oneself to focus solely on spiritual betterment. Two, in the 18th and 19th centuries, it was a way for women to exact control over their own bodies. So many scholars consider celibacy to be a feminist act. The Shakers regularly confess their sins to their elders in an effort to allow them to live virtually free of sin in their daily lives. And communal living allowed men and women to dwell together as families, brothers and sisters in faith, both sexes striving to create a heaven on earth. All individual property was given over to the community so that all were equal. It's important to keep in mind that this was a religious fa religion founded by a woman. So the ideal of equality, gender, economic, and racial was upheld throughout Shaker life and belief. Therefore, the Shakers were not only forerunners to women's rights movement, but also they accepted any race. They were African-American as well as Native American Shakers who enjoyed an equality that did not ex exist outside the boundaries of the villages. In addition to the values of equality and inclusion, other core beliefs and practices include pacifism, innovation, entrepreneurship, simplicity, perfection, and union, but I'll speak more to that in a bit. So Hancock Shaker Village. After landing in New York City in 1774, the Shaker is settled just outside of Albany at a place called Niskayuna, now called Water Valite. And in 1776, they quietly began to set down roots, working to make money so they could establish themselves in a separate community, a place to freely worship. The Shakers came to America at a time when people were casting about for something new to believe in. And from the mid 18th century, spiritual revivals of the Great Awakening were taking place throughout the Eastern New York and Western Massachusetts region. The time was right for Ann Lee's evangelical message of salvation, and she drew a number of converts from Protestant and Baptist congregations uh, by uh, traveling and preaching across the region. Around 1780, Shaker communities of Mount Lebanon, New York, and Hancock, Massachusetts, which are five miles apart on Route 20 um, here in Western Mass, were founded in quick succession after area farmers heard Mother Anne preach and converted to Shakerism. At Hancock, nearly 100 converts consolidated a community of land donated by local farmers, and by the 1830s, after a great many more conversions and additional land acquisitions, the village community peaked in population um, with more than 300 Shakers on more than 3,000 acres. During the height of their growth, religious fervor and socioeconomic influence, the Hancock Shakers erected communal dwelling houses, barns, workshops, and other buildings, and developed a large successful farm. The centerpiece to our village is still the iconic roundstone barn built in 1826 for Hancock's thriving dairy industry. It is often cited as the cathedral to the cow. This building exemplifies Shaker design and innovation over the years, demonstrated throughout the campus, the landscape, the architecture, the furniture, the tools, and the domestic objects. The Shakers surrounded the roundstone barn with many acres of cultivated medicinal herbs, vegetables, fruits, and other crops. They enjoyed a simple, peaceful, and hardworking life separated from the ways of the world. Um, the Shakers were proficient in a wide array of crafts, trades, and industries, including woodworking and metalworking, basketry, spinning, weaving, and broom making. Hancock specifically participated in the Shaker seed business, manufactured medicinal herbs and remedies, made yarn swifts, wool cards, brooms, and the sisters ran a very successful fancy goods shop well into the 1950s. In addition, they developed their own water powered mills for grinding grain, sawing wood and manufacturing textiles. Although the Shakers lived a separate communal existence, the various Shaker industries thrived due to the quality of their products, which became a very important source of income. Eventually, the sources of forces outside the community, including the Industrial Revolution, strengthening civil rights, and the shifting America from a, a rural to an urban society, worked against their continued growth and stability. By the 1900s, with dwindling converts, Shaker population at Hancock declined to about 50 believers, most of them sisters and orf orphan girls who had been adopted by the community, and only a few adult brethren. Many of the outlying acreage was sold off and buildings were raised during the final decades of the Hancock community. 
In 1959, when the Shakers could no longer maintain their buildings and land, they sold their remaining property to a, a local group committed to preserving the Shaker heritage. Today, Hancock Shaker Village continues its life as a living history museum with 20 authentic buildings, a working farm, and collection of approximately 22,000 Shaker works of uh, Shaker objects. We are open April through November. Um, and on select dates throughout the window, winter, excuse me, uh, like this coming Saturday where we are open for Hancock holidays. If and when you visit, you'll experience period rooms set up throughout the campus dedicated to Shaker life, work, and worship. Highlights include the aforementioned monument to the dairy industry, the 1826 Roundstone Barn, as well as our meeting house, the Shaker House of Worship built in 1786. In 1938, the Hancock Shakers raised the original meeting house. It was no longer used and they wanted to save on property taxes. What, what you visit today is um, the meeting house from Shirley, Massachusetts. Uh, both structures were identical, designed by brother Moses Johnson. And in 1962, the museum disassembled and moved the mu meeting house in Shirley in nine parts, reinstalling it on the foundation here at Hancock. In 2009, the museum conducted a paint analysis with Dr. Susan Buck and was able to restore the interior color to the original Prussian blue, blue being a significant color within the Shaker lexicon. Curatorial staff even ground and made the pigments by hand as the Shakers would have done for this project. The brick dwelling is uh, another heart of our campus. Built in 1830, it was constructed to house 100 shakers and dormitory style accommodations, up to five per bedroom or retiring room. The building includes communal dining room and meeting room, kitchen, cellar, and attic storage areas in addition to the retiring rooms. There is an in invisible line down the center of the dwelling to separate the sister side from the brethren's. Separate doorways, staircases, and wide hallways all serve to keep the interactions between the sexes to a minimum. The kitchen was the domain of the sisters and a large number of dumb waiters or sliding cupboards as the shakers called them, transported food up to the dining room on the next floor. The shakers famous built-in cupboards and drawers can be seen throughout the brick dwelling. This allowed for a less cluttered space and made cleaning easier with no top or feet to collect dust. Other architectural features include interior windows and transoms, what the shakers refer to as borrowed light, which allows interior spaces to be lit with natural light and lessen the need for artificial light, even on a gloomy day. It was in the brick dwelling where the majority of Sorry, it is in the brick dwelling where the majority of the village's collection is housed and displayed. Like many, what drew me to the Shakers is their design, a unique American vernacular that has remained a touchstone for generations of subsequent designer makers. Shaker objects are functional and beautiful, combining the finest materials with pristinely executed technique to create works that rethink the formal and social relationships between individuals, communities, and things. Since starting at Hancock two years ago, I've been fascinated by the history of Shaker design. Working within academic design programs, Shaker is per perpetually referenced uh, by emerging designers. And today, quote unquote, Shaker style is a staple of home decor and popular architecture design media. The cabinetry, three-legged candle stands, trussel tables, and slapback chairs are iconic and dating back to this 18th century, examples of perhaps the earliest iteration of American design. This was a time when style was imported. Um, early American decorative arts existed within regional European lineages, for example, Pen Pennsylvania German or New England neoclassical. Shaker is truly an American invention um, in its design and intent. So my question, is where did Shaker design come from? How did the Shaker aesthetic originate, evolve, and become codified across the Shaker diaspora, um, which I mentioned was these 20 plus communities across the Eastern US. <clears throat> and I have to tell you that there's no definitive answer here. Um, the development of Shaker design from the layout of communities to the formal and material tenets of handheld crafted objects is not documented. So I can only speculate based on what is recorded, narrative manuscripts, bylaws, financial ledgers, as well as the record of material culture, the objects left behind. What I can tell you is that the millennial laws, the rules governing Shakerism, which were released in 1821, and then again, um, formalized and re-released in 1845, as well as subsequently, outlined certain aspects of Shaker design. 
Color provides an interesting example here. Contrary to popular imagination, the Shakers lived in a brilliantly colorful world. Interior woodwork and floors were painted lively shades of yellow gold. Built-in cabinets were washed in a deep red. Furniture and small wares populated rooms with red, yellow, blue, and occasionally green. You can see this same palette reflected in the collection of Shaker gift drawings on view at New Britain Art Museum, which used the same exact pigments as the paint of Shaker Furch. The literal material was the same in the ink as well as the paint. The 1845 millennial laws stipulate that meeting houses must be white and blue, dwelling floors are reddish yellow, whereas shop floors are yellowish red, buildings are closer to the road, should be lighter than those further away, workshops should be a darker shade than dwelling house, and there's a lengthy laundry, laundry list detailing which objects may be painted, may not be painted, and may be varnished. Even so, the form and aesthetic of landscapes, buildings, and objects that we today recognize as shaker were established before the millennial laws at Hancock and Mount Lebanon in the latter decades of the 18th and the turn of the 19th century. It's my understanding that Father Joseph Meacham, the leader of the Shaker ministry following Mother Anne's death, had a heavy hand in developing and defining Shaker design. His background as a New Light Baptist preacher contributed to a sense of orderliness, which manifested in the strict geometries of Shaker community scapes and forms. Two, he and Mother Lucy Wright, who is his female counterpart in their ministry at Mount Lebanon, were tasked with establishing unity and harmony, not only for Mount Lebanon, but for the wider Shaker world at that time. The early Shaker architects were the first to relinquish their egos and practice designing and building as communities, creating structures and spaces, not only for the good of the single domestic unit, but rather to support the spiritual and economic lives of Shaker families, which ranged from a dozen to approximately 100 members, as was the case here at Hancock in the church family. It was Father Joseph Meacham who declared, all things made well, all work well done, plain and without superfluidity, a sentiment that continues to define Shaker design. This grand scheme for Shaker communities, or dare I say the divine plan, was a holistic approach, designing landscape, architecture, furniture, and domestic objects and tools as a total work of art, a vision of heaven on earth. So back to this question of Shaker design and its evolution, where did it come from? I have a few thoughts. First, Shaker communities were designed to be apart from the world. The architecture of scale of unique furniture and colorful landscape of communities would have facilitated the sense of departure for Shakers and non-Shakers alike. Second, Shaker communities were models of practicality and efficiency. The idea of every force evolves a form is made manifest by the Shakers. Objects created for communities were purpose and person driven. If a specific shaker sister needed a specific surface and a specific seat for a specific task, it was made for her. Everything was conceived and made with utmost intention. They were building heaven on earth here. The shakers had time to deeply consider their environment and design and construct a material landscape that manifested their beliefs. Shaker design begins intention, sorry, brings intention to the fore, simplicity, utility, and harmony, even if it meant abandoning all precedent. Three, symmetry was celestial. Visual symmetry grew out of theological symmetry, which, even, uh, which was even more meaningful to the Shakers who upheld the idea of a dual Godhead, God as Holy Father and Mother. Shaker design is the manifest manifestation of spiritual and moral values within everyday things. And finally, four, work is worship. We all know the quotation, put your hands to work and give your hearts to God. Do all your work as though you had a thousand years to live and as though you would, <laughs> and, as, and as you would if you knew you must die tomorrow. Excuse me, sorry. Work was entirely bound up in spiritual practice. Objects were necessary for life, but there are also items that were an extension of a spiritual journey. Every object you created could honor God and achieve perfection. There was a holistic approach to Shakerism that not only manifested in the total integration of life and belief, but that also led to the development of communities as machines for living. Every component of a Shaker community from land to architecture to handheld object operates in harmony. Two, the communal nature produced new forms of workmanship. Individual skills, experience, and taste were brought together to promote a high degree of efficiency and the evolution of a shared quote unquote style. In the formative decades, all artisanship was directed towards the community, a group uh, leading a common purposeful life, opposed to any drive 
to market demand. There was no gap between producer and consumer. It was a closed circuit. Objects were designed for group use. As time went on, what emerged was a characteristic shaker look, which was disseminated through the transmission of skill, traveling craftsmen and apprenticeship-like structure of shaker workshops, and the transmission of objects and even buildings in the case of the Moses Johnson Meeting House, um, which serves as prototypes of the shaker craft and aesthetic. In his History of the Shakers at Mount Lebanon, brother Isaac Newton Youngs wrote, we find out by trial what is best and, we have, and when we have found a good thing, we stick to it. The best of the best was adopted by other branches of the society and then evolved upon. What is so compelling about this codification of Shaker design and in fact the entire spectrum of Shaker life, work and belief in the early 19th century is that these linear minimal structures and rigid laws were developed in tandem with an intense period of spiritual fervor, the era of manifestations or mother's work. During the 1830s and 40s, a number of spiritually attuned mediums known as instruments were flooded with thousands of visions. Isaac Newton Youngs described, the windows of heaven and the avenues of the spirit world were set upon and innumerable gifts were showered down of visions, revelations, inspiration, messages from spirits, spiritual resents and new songs in profusion. It first began at Water Valite among the children. Some individuals were taken under a new and singular influence in a kind of vision or trance, unconscious of external things. Their spiritual sight was open, beholding things invisible to those around. Many of these quote unquote gifts came in the form of song, movement, written word, and visual art, um, many of which were relayed in otherworldly lexicons, unknown tongues, or the rich visual symbi symbology of the gift drawings, which drew from Masonic symbols as well as decorative arts motifs. It was an unwieldy time for the Shakers, divined by unpredictable visions and messages, the purpose of which was to deliver an immediate knowledge of heaven and instruct the Shakers on how to act and believe. In the early 1940s, the Shakers initiated new forms of spir spiritual practice and each community was given a spiritual name. Hancock was renamed the City of Peace. In September of 1942, the first mountain meeting was held. Mountain meetings were a short-lived Shaker ritual conducted at every community, generally in May and December um, from 1841 to 1854. Um, David Lamson described his, his mountain meetings in his book, Two Years Experience Among the Shakers, as beginning the evening before with fasting, prayer, confession, and the distribution of what he called spiritual clothing. Spiritual clothing was described as, for the brethren, a pair of beautiful fine trousers as white as snow. These resemble garments of purity with many shining stars thereon. The buttons of a sky blue color and the appearance of them like glass. A jacket of sky blue color also with gold buttons thereon and these buttons wrought in fine needlework, many elegant and pretty flowers of different colors, a coat of heavenly brightness. The sisters were dressed in, or quote unquote dressed, in corresponding gowns of heavenly brightness. On these are many stars and diamonds and your names also written thereon, a bonnet of silver color trimmed with white ribbon and also a pair of blue silk gloves. Of course, um, this description, it was all imaginary, these spiritual garments. Hancock's mountain meetings were convened at the Holy Feast Ground, an elevated swath of land about the size of a playing field at the end of a 1.5 mile hike up Mount Sinai, which is just across the street from the, the museum, the village today um, across Route 20. The Shakers <clears throat> approached the site through a grove of walnut trees where they, quote, halt in a circle, the elders and eldresses at the upper end of the grove, the sisters on their right and the brethren on their left, the lower end of each wing coming down in front to, as to form a circle or an ellipsis. At the center of the feast ground sat the fountain or the waters of life marked by a monumental fountain stone with the word of God engraved thereon and delineated by a low white fence. Under guidance from the ministry, spiritual gifts were revealed at this site. Instruments led the shakers in fictive activities, including anointing with oil, washing with feet, sowing and watering spiritual seeds, seeding from a spiritual bowl of love and union, and consuming sumptuous feasts while drinking mother's wine, which also caused figurative inebriation. Hannah Cahoon's A Bower of Mulberry Trees from 1854 provides an illustration of these heavenly meals. She, on the gift drawing, um, which is on view at New Britain, she wrote, I saw it distinctly, the long white table standing under the bower with cake and knives upon it. 
A Shaker manuscript in the collection of Sabbath Day Lake in Maine documents the first mountain meeting here at Hancock in September of 1842. It's described. Now saith the holy angel, turn your faces upwards towards the city of peace and give thee a hearty shout. We are all united and gave, <laughs> excuse me, we all united and gave three hearty shouts. Father William then said, I have brought a box of spectacles for the brethren and sisters that they may see more clearly spiritual things. We all placed a pair upon our eyes. Behold, I give unto you bread to feed your souls and wine to cheer your spirits as I know the taste and nourishment of natural food and the operation of natural wine. So understand that your souls must need to be fed. So receive ye of this new and living bread and partake freely of this heavenly wine that your hungry souls may be fed this day and receive strength and support therefrom. It's worth noting that the era of manifestations played out in tandem with a wider American spiritualist movement that also reached its peak in, the 19, in 1840, particularly in this region of Western Mass and upstate New York, which at the time was known as the burned over district. The second great awakening saw the emergence of the Mormons as well as the Millerites, a sect that believed the world was going to end on one of four dates in 1843 and 44. It didn't. A few years later, the Fox sisters would become known for their spirit wrappings. The Poughkeepsie seer, a clairvoyant, would begin practicing magnetic healings, and seances would become ubiquitous parlor tricks. Mary Todd Lincoln even held one at the White House in the 1860s. By the early 1850s, the Hancock Shakers began to allow non-Shaker spiritual mediums into their communities to conduct seances. Point being that this was a truly radical era and in many ways, it contradicts this popular idea of the Shakers as pious and reserved and without quote unquote superfluidities. But the Shakers who designed and built these groundbreaking minimal and beautiful works of furniture so seminal within the history of American deck arts and design were the same Shakers who marched up mountains, got drunk on imaginary wine and spoke in tongues. Um, I'd like to close by uh, examining a gift drawing in the collection of Philadelphia Museum of Art. So sadly not on view at New Britain. Um, that is a really, wonderful example of collapsing these two very dissonant aspects of Shaker history, the formalization of Shaker design and the era of manifestations. The piece is The Holy City attributed to Polly Jane Reed of Mount Lebanon um, in 1843. I think the connection here is pretty explicit. A spiritualist drawing containing the strict linear geometries that define Shaker design and architecture. The map uh, is accompanied by a manuscript explanation of the Holy City with its various parts and appendices pointed out, written by an author only identified as Adam, whose spirit left heaven and visited Mount Lebanon on March 16th of 1843 to provide the Shakers with a plan of heaven so that they could reflect it in God's redemptive city on earth. The text includes a detailed description of the various courts, springs, gardens, and temples, and the manner in which the deserving souls might pass through these guarded gates. <clears throat> Excuse me. To the east or top uh, of the, the gift drawing inside the square city is the fountain of holy waters of life, fed by seven springs and surrounded by 12 pillars supporting the temple of the house of the Lord upon his holy mountain. From the fountain to the east and west, the river of life flows out through the gates of faith and honesty to spread over the world. Trees bearing 12 kinds of fruit line the golden riverbanks, and there is, quote, a vast number of beautiful and heavenly trees in gardens and yards all about the city. And among the branches of these trees, the heavenly and beautiful birds are, con are continuously tuning their joyful, joyful notes. There is order here, a distinctly shaker form of careful intentional order comprised of right angles, lines, and perfect curves. The millennial laws of 1821 dictated, it is considered good order to lay out and fence all kinds of lots, fields, and gardens in a square form. And if a brother or sister be missing in a meeting or at a table, when one who comes next should fill up the place so that there be no gap left for the devil to go between. The Shakers upheld uni uniformity as a spiritual imperative, and their communities are manifestations of this patter pattern and order in all things. The Holy City gift drawing indicates that the Shakers can at once brace, embrace order and chaos, unity and rupture, earth and heaven. In a way, all gift drawings are maps, maps of the past to 
and the divine world beyond. Um, next time you're in the galleries at New Britain Art Museum, I would love for you all to consider the relationships between gift drawing and maps. And um, that is where I will leave you this afternoon. And I would be um, oh, happy to take any questions at this point. Sarah, thank you so much. I can't wait to, um, to go into the museum um, and think of the gift drawings as maps. That, that's just a wonderful idea. There's so many other things I, I, you said that I'd love to um, explore more and maybe ask some questions, but there is a question in the chat that I'd like to uh, ask you. Uh, what of Shaker design and Shaker life most inspired you to focus your studies and career on Shaker? <sighs> That's a that's a great question. I think um, I was I before working here and in fact before visiting here, I was so accustomed to seeing um, shaker furniture as I think many of you see it uh, in a white walled gallery. So separate from the context in which it was made and used. And um, I visited Hancock for the first time, um, maybe about three years ago, and I think seeing the landscape, seeing the gardens and farms, seeing the historic architecture and then the objects within them and sort of imagining the engagement, not only between sort of these varying sort of stratospheres of atmosphere, but also between the people who would have lived and worked with them in this community. I mean, it just opened up a whole new perspective in terms of what these objects meant in um, not only the context of, you know, American design and Descartes history, but also within the the fields of utopian history and theory, agriculture, communal studies, et cetera, et cetera, feminist studies, it, go, it goes on and on. And so I think what's really exciting about Shaker design are precisely these connections that can be made between the design aesthetic and things like spiritualism and the spiritualist movement in the United States in the 19th century. And so, um, sorry, that's not a very precise answer, but I, I hope that <laughs> it's a great answer. It's a great. Well, in, and also I'm thinking about color in terms of design. You mentioned the red, the blue, the yellow, and they're very particular types of yellows. And, and then sometimes green. And I see behind you, uh, it looks like a chest that's in a kind of a green. Um, yep. And so could you just talk a little bit more about color? And even if there's an object in the room that you think, um, you know, sure. speaks to this. Yeah, absolutely. I think yeah, this is one of the um, aspects of Shaker life that I think we try very actively to sort of demythologize here was that the Shaker world was so, so colorful. And it was actually the decisions made by collectors and even museum per personnel in the mid and early um, 20th century when these objects began to be collected to actually strip the color from the objects and buildings. Um, and so quite a bit of the work of my predecessor, Christian Goodwillie, was actually to, to research the original, original pigmentation on surfaces and objects and re renew it in various spaces throughout the village, which was really, really exciting. So you can see evidence of those projects when you visit today. But color in general, I mean, there are very precise and um, codified meanings associated with different colors uh, that you see throughout the Shaker village. Um, that of course, I mean, the meanings evolved over time but some examples that I mentioned that um, the floors and cabinetry, the peg rails were all painted yellow, this really lovely shade of sort of golden ochre yellow, whereas the built-in drawers and cabinets were all washed in red and it's sort of like a nice sort of oxblood red. Um, the, the worship, spaces of worship are much sort of easier to sort of define where the, the meaning of the blue came from. So even not only the interiors of the meeting houses were painted in a really lovely deep shade of Prussian blue, but even objects from meeting houses, you know, from the wood box to other sort of smaller tools were also painted in that blue to sort of delineate where they came from. I mean, I think the connection between blue and the divine heavens is pretty explicit in many, many cultures. And that is true here. Um, we have a, a pink horse barn on our campus, which is a wild shade of salmon. Um, that is very surprising. The workhouses, our um, brethren and sisters workshops are a lovely sort of shade of ochre yellow, which actually in the um, Benjamin Moore paint color book is called spicy mustard. And so, I mean, it was a very, it was a coded existence. I mean, so you could tell not only who an object belonged to or what space it belonged to, what purpose it served in the community by its color, but also the purpose of buildings and other um, structures as well. Fabulous. And I know that um, at, at 
at the Newport Museum, certainly there's a lot of attention to color. You know, in our installation in the Miller Gallery, um, and I don't know if Steve Miller's on this call today, but he um, and working in consultation with curators and our, our collection staff spend a lot of time carefully selecting the right color for the right installation to be to be, you know, truthful. I did see Miriam Miller's name in the attendees list. So I did too. So I don't know if it's Miriam yeah. or Steve. But... <laughs> um, are there any other questions? Let's see. Here we go. Um, could you elaborate on the concept of gift drawings as maps? Because that's fascinating. Yeah, I mean, this is not something I've thought through, um, you know, in as detailed as I would like, but I think, um, I mean, the gift drawings are so rich. They are layered with text-based messages in English and in other sort of more spiritual languages. They have all of these um, embedded and interwoven symbols relating um, to uh, decorative arts motifs at the time. So they came from textiles, quilt making, they even came from ceramics. Um, or, you know, we see these Masonic checkerboards and other um, sort of motifs from, from that. So they're just um, so, uh, I mean, I don't think we can ever really, and I'm sure Sharon spoke to this, we can never really resolve the actual precise meanings of these gift drawings, but I do think this coming together of sign and symbol really is a cartog, uh, like an exercise in cartography in many ways, and that it creates these connections and pathways between humans' beliefs and this otherworldly realm. And so um, I hope that makes sense. It's mapping in a very much more abstract way. I'm not speaking entirely literally here, although it is literal, I think, in the case of the map of the Holy City more so. Um, but I, I hope that makes sense. It's more about um, building, uh, developing and building pathways and connections, if, if that makes sense. That's beautiful, beautifully said in between the human and spiritual realm. That's very helpful, actually. Yeah. And in um, fact, it, like, the bower of mulberry trees to sort of go back to that image I showed I, I love that image um there's a I forget who uh there's a scholar um I believe it's in the catalog associated with the um exhibition of gift drawings that was at the drawing center uh I guess uh, 20 years ago at this point but it's a lovely catalog and um she analyzes that uh image from a very sort of art historical um visual analysis, which is fascinating, actually, because that's also um, not something uh, I've necessarily considered to sort of, but anyway, point being is that she, um, she, she reads the Bower of Mulberry Trees as an actual gateway, this real sort of literal arching of two trees, which in itself was a Christian icon um, to, to pass through this archway into this divine realm. And so I, I, there is something there about um, providing, you know, access and, um, I don't know, vision. Uh, that is, I think, very akin to sort of a cartographic exercise. That's wonderful. Um, another question, uh, because their designs were so utilitarian, did they ever give a nod to comfort? Oh, that's a great question. Well, I mean, to address that, we first need to be reminded that the history of the Shakers, I mean, I mentioned there are still three living Shakers and they still make things. Um, so the, the, it spans, you know, almost 300 years at this point. And so um, it changed over time. And so comfort is a very, uh, fascinating conundrum. And I think we'd also need to examine the idea of comfort, not in relation to the context of decorative arts and design at the time. So if we're looking at the early 19th century, where a lot of the designs I showed came from, I think the notion of comfort was very different than what we perceive as comfort today. Two, I think we'd also have to examine comfort within the context of um, religious history and theory in terms of like a Christian belief in comfort, which to be perfectly honest, I am not qualified to speak to, but I'd be very interested to hear somebody who could. Um, but I will. what I can say is that <laughs> while the designs, like this chair, I'm sitting in a ladder bag chair, it is not comfortable. After 30 minutes, I am very uncomfortable in this thing. And so I think that was definitely intentional, but they were, as I mentioned, designing things really bespoke for specific um, people and specific tasks. So I think there's a certain comfort in that. 
And two, later on, um, towards the end of the 19th and into the 20th century, we definitely see more furniture being upholstered. We see things like day beds being made with these cushy uh, fat cushions. Um, there are a lot of rocking chairs and footstools and things to make the aging population certainly more comfortable. So yes, 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 I will say comfort was a consideration if they were trying to sort of eschew and challenge comfort or if they were trying to accommodate it. And so I think that changed over time. Really great question. And actually, I really wanna dig into that idea more. So thank you for that. Great question, great answer too. Thank you for that answer, Sarah. Um, are there any other last questions before we wrap up or any other last thoughts from you, Sarah, that um, have come to mind because of the questions? Um, no, I just would like to put out one more plug for all your audience to come visit us in the springtime. Um, we are open this Saturday, as I mentioned, for Hancock holidays, and then we'll reopen in April with our baby animals fest. And so please come consider visiting us um, in the spring. We're just an hour from Hartford. So it's an easy day trip. And we have uh, not only the beautiful works of design and craft, but also a full barnyard of really fun, cute and cuddly animals. Although they're not cuddly, it's a working farm but um, you can imagine that part. So anyway, um, and please also, if you have further questions or would like more information or um, even the, the slides, as I mentioned, or images, just get in touch with me directly by email, please. Absolutely, wonderful. Thank you so much. I cannot wait to return to, uh, to, to the museum and to see uh, the village again and uh, look forward to seeing you uh, there very soon. Be well. Thanks to everyone for joining us this afternoon. This was really an insightful and, and wonderful talk, Sarah. Thank you so very much. Thank you all. Right. Take care.